Hello, welcome back to the next in our uh, series of tutorials here on the introduction to the IDF to pH toolkit. So if you've been following along, um, hopefully you have a, a, a working rig at this point where you've got your geometry being modeled in Rhino, you've got your grasshopper set up where we create our honeybee zones, we add some interior rooms, we export those zones to Energy Plus, we bring that back in and convert it to PHPP information, we set up the PHPP and then ultimately export all that data back to an active PHPP. So hopefully that's working for you. Hopefully you're getting some results at this point. Um, uh, uh, and now what I'd like to do is take a little bit closer look at the PHPP, start to analyze some of the results that we're getting. So we're starting to get some actual results. We, we, we have enough information now to, to actually see a, a rudimentary energy model for the performance of this silly little building that we've been building. Um, you know, there's a lot we haven't done here. There's, there's not one window in the whole project. And obviously, uh, you know, the room layout is kind of silly. We don't have any domestic hot water systems, etc. You know, there's all sorts of things that we haven't built in yet, but we're at least starting to get some results. So let's take a look at those results and, and then uh, uh, use that as a, an entry point to discuss how we're going to start to add some more detail to our overall project. So here's my active PHPP, my working PHPP. Let me maximize that so we can take a little easier, a little better view of it here. Oops. And what I'd like to do first is take a look at the verification worksheet and let's see what kind of results we're getting. So what kind of results are we seeing here? Well, first of all, we've got our treated floor area. 280 square meters for, for this project, so I don't know, 3,000 square feet, something like that. Um, we have a heating demand, an annual heating demand of 190 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. And if you look over here on the right for uh, Passivals certification to the PHI Classic through the international certification, our target would be 15 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. Now, of course, we're, we still have a lot of stuff to yet to detail here. Um, or, or yet to determine, um, and, and you know, 15 is not always our, our target. If it was a low energy building, our target would be 30. If it was a, you know, renovation in a cold climate like New York, our target would be 20. Uh, you know, so different targets that we could shoot for. But um, in any event, our heating demand looks very high compared to our target here. We are getting no result whatsoever for cooling demand. And down here, we're getting very silly results for our primary energy demand. So, you know, primary energy, we still have some work to do. Um, that's primarily because we haven't modeled any mechanical systems yet. So we're not actually able to get any useful information out of our primary energy because we don't have any system information. So let's hold off on that. We don't worry about that yet. And let's just focus on this heating energy demand first. Well, then we'll then we'll get our cooling working, and then we'll get into our mechanical systems as well. So why do we have such a high heating energy demand on this project? What is it that's causing us to have such a high heating energy demand? Well, the way that we can determine that is pretty easily by going into the heating worksheet. And there's some good breakdown information here. This is all summary data. This is None of this is input. It's all summary data. It's going to tell us a little bit about how our building is performing. And the place that we would usually start would be, to buy, would be to come down here to the bottom to this summary graph. So there's a little summary graph here. Let me zoom out a little bit so that we can see that a little more easily. So here's our energy balance graph. Uh, losses on the left, gains on the right. We have a lot of losses and not very many gains, which means we have a resultant heat demand of 190 kilowatt hours per square meter. Now, what is it that's causing all of these losses? Well, if we look at the breakdown over here, we have some ventilation losses. So, okay, sure, not, not crazy, but sure. Uh, we have uh, some floor losses. So we have some losses through the floor. And then we have this giant blue bar. What is this? These are losses through the roof. So for some reason, we have really high heat loss through the roof and then pretty high heat loss through our walls as well. So we can know that or this is an indication that there's something going on with the roof. We have to figure out what's happening with our roof. If we come up to our uh, transmission loss panel here, so this is our transmission loss data. Let me zoom in a little bit so we can see that a little easier. So here's our transmission loss data and you can see that. So here's our exterior walls. We have some area. We have a U value of 0.45, pretty bad, but not catastrophic. Uh, gives us a total heat, a total heat loss over the course of the winter time. That's our walls, um, and then we have our roof. Our roof has an area, and oh my, look at the U value here, 1.4. So a really, really um, a, a poor U value, which is going to result in a very, very high heat loss over the course of the winter time. 
And we have our floor slab, which has you know kind of a uh, not very good U value as well. We don't have any windows in the project. We don't have any doors in the project. We don't have any th thermal bridges in the project yet. Uh, we'll, we'll add all that as we go. But just from this information here, I can see that there's something weird happening with the roof. The roof has a very high uh, U value associated with it for some reason. So let's see if we can figure out what that what that is. Let's go back to our areas worksheet and let's take a look at the roof. So let's take a look at the roof. Let's find the roof on our list of surfaces here. Oh, yeah. Well, I happen to know that this one is the roof because it's been categorized as the roof, but boy, wouldn't it be better if it was labeled roof? That would make my life an awful lot easier. So before we go any further at all, before we get into any discussion of U values and materials and constructions, etc. We need to talk about how we're going to manage the surface naming information. How are we going to name these surfaces? How are we going to manage that information? Well, we're going to manage it back in the Rhino scene. Now, we could, if we chose, manage it in the Grasshopper scene. So it is true that we could come in here. So I'm going to come into the place, the part of my definition where we create the honeybee zone. And it is true that we could come into our standard honeybee create services here and we could pass in some names. So for instance, I could pass in surface name. And if I pass that in, you'll see that they all get named surface name uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, so that wasn't super helpful. Um, if I was to turn this into a multi-line component and I was to call this surface name A name B name C another um, different one and last one we'll see that those names are going to flow through as well um, what did we just do there? This is item access. We need to change this to list access. Sorry about that. And let's see what happens when we do that. So we change that to list access. Let's see if that works better. No, it does not know how to deal with that. That's interesting. Why does it know how to deal with that? Oh, I know why. Right, don't worry about that. So don't do that. Turn that back to item access. Now, this is going to be weird for a second. Why is this being so weird? Why is this not working for me? I'm passing in a list of five names, and I, or a list of six names, and I have six surfaces. Well, I don't have six surfaces. I actually have one surface, or I have one uh, geometry object. So I have one geometry object and six surfaces. So this guy is running six times, and it's outputting a tree, and so it's actually generating six PHPP models. So it's kind of all sorts of screwed up. What we need to do is come in and explode our solid into a series of individual surfaces. So I'm just going to type explode, hit explode. Now what we're going to get is we're going to get six surfaces input and six names, and the names are going to correspond to the surfaces that are going to come through. Uh, so there we go. Now everything is working properly. So now we have our, our names flowing through. But notice that the order is kind of all mixed up. So, so I don't actually know what order these surfaces come in. Like I don't know which, which surface is which surface. And so my naming here is uh, challenging at best. Right? There's not really any way that I can sort of do this. Now I could, let's get rid of this for a second, get rid of that. Now I could bring these in one at a time. So I could say, you know, here's my, here's my roof. I could bring that in, say one boundary representation, and I could make a surface, and I could make these one at a time and name them that way. So for, for sure, I could do it this way. Right? This would be one method. Uh, and then I would do a different one for the floor, set one VREP, and floor, there we go. Right, so I could do that, and then I could combine these all together into, you know, I could, I could weave them together into a single zone, so that would be fine. I could do it that way. The problem that I have with that is that we end up with a lot of stuff to manage on our Grasshopper Canvas, and I don't love that. I also don't feel like it's terribly intuitive. So, you know, when I'm working in Rhino, if I want to name a surface, 
where do we name a surface? Well, we come into the properties, and properties has a name field. And so my instinct is always to put my name, put the name of the surface here. But notice that that name does not flow through into our PHPP. This name of the surface does not get used in the creation of these honeybee surfaces, unfortunately. So this is where we're going to use the first of one of our new um, IDF to pH components. And this is the component which is going to allow us to harvest this kind of data out of the Rhino scene. So if I want to name all my surfaces in the Rhino scene, which I often do, I, I like to work that way, I want that data to flow through into my grasshopper scene. So how are we going to do that? In front of the honeybee create surfaces, we're going to add a new component. So if I come to O1 model, we're going to add a brand new component here from our, our IDF to pH toolkit. And we're going to add this get surface params component. So this get surface params component, we're going to drop this onto the canvas. And let me make a little room. We're going to put this in front of our honeybee surface. So notice it's going to take as input some surfaces. And it's going to yield as output some geometry. And then we'll take a look at all the rest of these things as well. So instead of feeding my pipeline into my honeybee component, what I'm going to do is take my pipeline, feed it into this new IDF component, take the geometry output, and give it to the geometry input. So I'm going to connect geometry to geometry. Now, nothing got any better down here. I still have all these ugly names. So how is this helping me at all? Well, if we take a look at some of the other outputs, so we have the geometry output for sure, so a list of surfaces, those gets passed through to the geometry. We also have this surface names output, and if I take a look at the surface names output, notice there's my roof, and then a series of nulls for all of the unnamed surfaces, so call this another name, and there's my another name. So this is now reading sort of live from the Rhino scene. So anything I do in the Rhino scene, call this wall 01, anything I do in the Rhino scene is now going to pop in. And notice that wall 1 is in slot number 3. And that's because that wall, if we look at our geometry list, so surface number 3, this untrimmed surface, is wall 1. So the order of the names and the order of the surfaces match up. What does that mean? Well, it means I can take my surface names and pass them in to my honeybee object here. And now notice I'm getting the right names in the right places on the right surfaces. Okay, so if I come in here and I grab my floor, we'll call this the floor. And notice that flows through. And there's my floor surface. So this uh, new component used in front of, used in conjunction with the Honeybee uh, basic create surfaces component is going to allow us to pull a bunch of information out of the Rhino scene. And the most basic of that information is going to be the surface name. So that's going to be one really useful piece of information that we could uh, include. Now we're going to be able to pull a lot more information as well. So we can pull surface type, boundary condition, uh, construction assembly. All of these things can be assigned and managed back in the Rhino side, and we can use this component to pull that information in and feed it into our Honeybee tools in a really automatic way. So we'll see that in future videos. Uh, I think we'll cut this one off here, and um, I will uh, uh, see you back in the future videos. We'll, we'll take a look at how we can do that. How do we manage things like boundary conditions? How do we manage things like surface assignments and um, surface types, etc.? cetera? So um, we'll, we'll come back and take a look at that in the next videos. Um, but I think we'll cut this one off here. All right, thanks, everyone.